Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you to yet another one in the series of what works, what doesn't, and why insights from evaluation. For those of you, and I can see many familiar faces here, those of you who have attended the previous what works, you know that uh, we build it around our recent evaluations. In this case, we are going to be talking about the uh, sector-wide evaluation of ADB's water sector policy and program. So we don't necessarily restrict the discussion to the lessons from the evaluation, but we take the narrative forward and we discuss the road up ahead as we plan to do this time as well. Talking about water, I mean, I think that there can be no disagreement on the fact that water is at the heart of economic development. While the role of managing water resources efficiently and extending quality services such as irrigation, water supply, sanitation, and wastewater treatment for bettering lives and enhancing economic development is commonly understood, the role of water in the journey towards climate security is not that commonly understood. We will discuss this aspect and many more in the discussion that is to follow. But for now, I'd like to invite Srinivas. Uh, he led this evaluation to come and make a presentation which will uh, serve as a sort of a backdrop for the discussion that is to follow. Srini. Thank you, Saleya. Good morning, everyone. To, for this afternoon, I'll be following this outline. So first, give a description of the water sector portfolio. Then a brief summary on the findings on performance and results, and, and then on the organizational aspects of delivery of water operations, and then the five key messages and uh, the associated recommendations. So we'll start with the um, water sector portfolio for the evaluation period. The ADB made a total uh, financial commitment of 26 billion US dollars. 94% of this was for uh, the sovereign operations. And standalone project loans were the most common um, financing modalities used uh, with 62%. In terms of the um, regional, uh, the South Asia received the largest share of financing with 37%. And two of the DMCs, uh, India and the PRC together, accounted for a large uh, part of the portfolio, which is 40, 44%. In terms of subsectors, the urban water supply had 27% of the portfolio and 16% for irrigation. And uh, the rural water supply and sanitation is uh, just uh, 3%. So now we discuss the findings from the portfolio performance. For the 125 uh, projects that were evaluated, we find that 67% of them were rated successful. Performance was the strongest in East Asia with 90% projects rated successful. Irrigation projects had the highest success rate with 86%. And urban Sewerage projects were the least successful, with 47% rated successful. In terms of um, targets that were specified in the water operational plan, some of the indicators that could not be achieved were um, the non-revenue water reduction and uh, the amount of uh, uh, non-sovereign operations financing. So next, we'll summarize the results from the evaluation. We s noticed that access to clean water supply, sanitation, and irrigation services improved. Although the contribution was modest uh, in, in terms of the rural water supply and sanitation and, and also wastewater treatment, uh, women's participation was seen to uh, increase, both uh, design and implementation as well as the decision-making processes. Uh, some of the water projects contributed to water use efficiency, like in irrigation and urban water systems, which need to uh, be scaled up more. Uh, capacity of uh, the executing and implementing agencies was strengthened for procurement and contract management and also capacity of the water user associations were strengthened for the operations and management of assets. 
Uh, then uh, we know, also found that integrated approaches to ecosystem and water resources management at river basin scale uh, were piloted in some of the projects, and these also need to be um, replicated and uh, scaled up. However, the efforts uh, we found uh, were lagging in terms of support for the national and sub-national level policies, uh, including for the uh, tariff setting and providing the enable, enabling environment for the private sector investments. So that's uh, the summary of the main results found. And in terms of the organizational aspects for the delivery of water operations, the staff strength has increased during the evaluation period, and the gender parity has improved. What we found in terms of performance, it highlights the quality at entry issues, like design issues, like you know, not um, having over ambitious uh, targets, um, and not in some of the projects not taking into account the need for capacity development. Um, it, the key organizational issues that that were um, noticed where the water expertise is splintered across uh, different divisions in the uh, in the bank and um, so there is a need for greater collaboration and co coordination um, between water and other sectors and thematic groups and there is also an inadequate capture and dissemination of knowledge from uh, operations documents and um, inadequate uh, resident mission capacity for design and implementation of um, quality <laughs> projects, water projects. Next we'll, um, this is the final uh, slide which discusses the key messages that come out of the evaluation. So one of them is the, that ADB has not yet prioritized uh, strategic themes to strengthen national water policy outcomes. And so we have a recommendation corresponding to this that uh, there needs to be a greater focus on uh, policy uh, in ADB operations. Uh, the second key message is that support for the accelerated adoption of um, integrated water resource management principles will require a systematic approach. Uh, the third message is that ADB does not adequately track and report progress on water policy elements and the operational plan targets. So there is a recommendation in the report that uh, the monitoring and evaluation systems need to be strengthened. The fourth key message is um, fragmented um, organizational structure. Uh, it hinders delivery of uh, integrated and sustainable water solutions and also adequate capture and dissemination of knowledge. Uh, the fifth one is that the 2001 water policy is dated and uh, somewhat diminished in relevance due to the recent changes in the context, especially with respect to climate change and the new corporate commitments related to SDGs, etc. So there is a recommendation on the, uh, in the report on updating of the water policy as well. So that's, that's from me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Shini. And that does set context to today's discussion. For what works, uh, we usually invite somebody from the board. Uh, we have management, and we have a technical voice on the panel. But listening to uh, you know feedback, uh, we always adapt ourselves and listen to demands. And there was a demand that we should have the voices of resident missions as well into what works. So uh, let's uh, quickly listen to this video where we have some voices from the resident missions on the evaluation report. <laughs> The uh, excellent findings of the IED report noted that uh, Cambodia is among the lowest performing countries from the sovereign side, with three out of five projects rated less than successful. Complex implementation arrangements, weak institutional capacity, and all these factors are to blame. So the real question uh, that we should be asking is, uh, why is still this the case despite many years of support on this front? And what have we done right? What have we done wrong? And how can this be addressed? 
Another key issue the report highlights is this whole issue of lack of financing for operation and maintenance of irrigation schemes. In Cambodia, it's again spot on. In Cambodia, we're currently piloting uh, a public-private partnership scheme with uh, co-financing from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Ministry of Economy and Finance, which has huge potential of scaling up if successful. I do agree with the recommendations of the IED report and support the idea first to continue improvement of the national legislation and development policies with a specific focus on the climate resilience. Second, to contribute to the financial sustainability of the climate related sectors. And third, to strengthen institutional capacities of the concerned stakeholders to enable them to better respond to the climate challenges. As focal for water sector and climate change in Tajikistan resident mission, for me, findings of this water evaluation have been very helpful. I am glad that this evaluation has added value to our unit by endorsing that water conservation and water use efficiency is one of the seven strong water policy elements. I also note that the report recommended ADB to more effectively leverage its limited financing to strengthen national and sub-national water-related institutions and increase development impact. The improved performance of ADB-funded irrigation projects in India is attributed to better understanding of farmers' perceptions and concerns, trainings to water user groups, gender mainstreaming, and adequate resources for operation maintenance. I do agree with the evaluation recommendation that what ADB approach to work in the water sector. In this way, ADB rest mission will be flatline to work with clients in water sector. One ADB approach will expanding private sector loan in water sector as we have worked public sector many years. Institutional and uh, policy aspects in many DMCs has foundation to absorb private sector loan. That was from the front lines. And now moving on to the panel discussion. We have a very esteemed panel with us, some of the best voices from uh, the bank uh, to speak on this topic. Uh, may I invite Senior, Senior Director of Water and Urban Development Sectors Group, Norio Saito, A.D. Kiko Takahashi, Chief of Sectors Group Ramesh Subramanian, and as always, uh, What Works panel discussion will be moderated by DGID Manny Jimenez. Manny, it's over to you now. I'm off. Thanks very much, uh, Saleha, and uh, welcome, uh, Norio, uh, Keiko, Ramesh. Thank you very much for joining us to this uh, What Works uh, event. Uh, uh, we'll be having just a conversation about, uh, and as uh, Saleha mentioned, using the evaluation as a base for uh, really looking forward on what needs to be done in, in, in the water sector. So the way we'll do this is we'll have just a conversation for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll be taking questions from the floor and from online. I hope that my colleagues will be letting us know what those uh, are. but. Uh, We'll be giving all of you time here in the room uh, to ask those uh, those questions. So, uh, you heard the uh, voices from uh, IED, the voices from the front lines. Uh, I think we all agree that this is a really critical uh, sector for uh, economic development uh, overall, and it uh, cuts across almost everything that uh, ADB is promising uh, on its corporate uh, results, uh, including on climate as well as on food security, and of course health and uh, other other issues. Uh, uh, Norio, uh, can I start with you? First of all, congratulations on your new role to oversee uh, the uh, water uh, sector in, uh, in in the ADB. Uh, I understand that uh, you're now looking at how you might address some of the issues that uh, Srini raised in the evaluation about how to coordinate better within within ADB. But I wanted to ask you your views on looking ahead. 
what are some of the priorities as you see it uh, on how ADB might tackle some of the really challenging questions that have been raised, uh, especially on how the sector could address uh, resilience and, uh, and climate and a lot of other issues. So, Noria? Okay, thank you, Mani, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, actually, I have not uh, assumed this new position yet. So what I'm going to speak is mainly based on my experience in, in South Asia. So I hope that's OK. So um, about the priorities, um, ADB finalized this water sector directional guide late last year, which has five guiding principles. So those are strengthen um, water resilience. And uh, then that's the first one. Second one is gender equality. Third one is environmental sustainability and th th circular economy. The fourth one is strength in governance and catalyzed financing. And the last one is technology and innovation. So, so these are all very you know, important areas. Maybe I can just focus one area, which is environmental sustainability and circular economy. So this area, for example, you know, we need to do more on the wastewater treatment and sanitation. In the last few years, we have been able to mainstream this citywide inclusive sanitation, or CWIS in short. So basically, this approach is to give access everyone in the city uh, the sanita you know, sustainable sanitation services, basically or in, in oftentimes combining centralized sewer network system in core city areas, but still utilizing on-site sanitation systems in the peripheral areas to ensure the cost effectiveness so that, so that the system overall can be affordable to the, to the city's water utilities. But this approach has been really well received by our clients because in the past clients, thought, you know, maybe some clients really wanted to have full-fledged sewer network in, in the entire city, which is too costly. But also in addition to the investment, ADB supported strengthening operators' capacity, piloting new technologies, and also strengthening policies, raising awareness. So that kind of comprehensive support was provided to wastewater and sanitation areas. And also uh, on this uh, circular economy issue, we have been strengthening support to like uh, reuse of treated wastewater. Um, right now, my colleagues working in Rajasthan in India, collaborating with OPPP, how this treated wastewater. So ADB support is up to the secondary treatment, but we are trying to uh, invite the private sector to come in for the uh, tertiary treatment and the delivery to the industries. So, so that kind of arrangement will also help you know, promote the circular uh, economy ideas. And the last, one, last point I can mention is nature-based solutions. Uh, in our division, last year we processed Bangladesh Coastal Towns project, and uh, well, this is a sort of type two climate project, but, but other than that, um, nature-based solution is going to be piloted in uh, several uh, municipalities using this AD13 thematic grant. And also another project in uh, Chennai, then Jeff Grant was mobilized to do uh, lake rejuvenation. So, so those you know, progresses have been made to address this water, sorry, circular economy, environmental sustainability issue. But actually, all, across all the areas, I want to stress is the importance of strengthening the enabling environment. This is policies, institutions, and regulations. Look at this wastewater reuse, for example. Even if we want to promote wastewater reuse, if the local regulations still allow the industries to use groundwater abstraction, then it's very difficult to promote industrial, you know, the reuse of the treated wastewater. Same, apply, same applies for this, uh, uh, the tariff issue. If the raw water tariff is too low, then no industry would be you know, interested in buying treated waste of water from, from somewhere else. So, so I think uh, one thing that we want to uh, strengthen is really to support better policies, institutions, and regulations um, under this new operating model or, 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 or the water sector 
uh, in the next uh, several years. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks very much, Norio. Uh, really interesting uh, to hear about the innovations that are taking place on the ground, especially to address uh, environmental uh, issues uh, and uh, some of the uh, technical, uh, uh, new technical things that you're doing are uh, really fascinating. But also, I think your point about uh, the overall enabling environment is, is, is key. Uh, uh, Ramesh, if I could turn to you, uh, you you're not going to be overseeing not just water, but all the sectors in the uh, ADB. So I hope uh, uh, you agree with what Norio said about what the priorities are in the, in the sector. Uh, but I wanted to also uh, ask you, though, uh, uh, from, you know, you've been uh, the regional uh, uh, director general in, uh, for uh, some time. And uh, your experience with uh, whether the DMCs, our partners in the field, are aligned with the priorities that ADB has as an institution, and, and uh, how can we serve their needs better? Thank you uh, so much, Manny. Thanks for this opportunity. I, this is the fourth time I think I'm participating in uh, what uh, works. Always found it fascinating. I agree with all the points that uh, Norio made because he knows the sector very well. And as I see many colleagues in, uh, in uh, water, as, as well as uh, many areas that are very closely related to water. Uh, on the last point that you mentioned, are the countries of the DMCs aligned with us? Uh, I would say yes uh, in almost all cases. Uh, I say almost all cases because the, but there is one common constraint that we face in countries where there is full alignment, but you don't see results. I'll mention a couple of areas later. And that is largely because of capacity constraints that we face, whether at the national government level or at the local uh, government level. And water, whether we look at um, you know, water uh, as, as a source in terms of irrigation or water as a source for water supply, uh, clearly the issues are very different in terms of the institutional arrangements, how countries have structured themselves, uh, what kind of resources are provided, what kind of operations and maintenance uh, systems you have in place. And the uh, report, uh, the IED report, picks up uh, on, a, on a lot of these uh, dimensions. Um, so alignment is there, but um, results are obviously different across the countries uh, based uh, on, on the uh, on, on project-specific conditions that uh, we have, as well as the results that uh, we see. Now, uh, uh, two issues that I wanted to pick up. You know, in the new operating model context, uh, there are four shifts being talked about, climate shift, uh, private sector development shift. Uh, the solutions and the new ways of working, I'll, I'll actually park for a moment, but let me focus on climate and the uh, private sector shift. And Norio picked up on some dimensions in the, of the uh, climate shift. Uh, if, if we look at uh, the um, one of the one of the annexes that you have in the uh, uh, report, uh, particularly uh, on the looking at the water operational uh, plan results framework, one area that's highlighted is um, the uh, need for increased efficiency and productivity in the delivery of water services. Now that we have scored low uh, across the board, looking uh, you know, across for the many countries uh, over the past uh, several years. Um, and, and here you have irrigation productivity and efficiency, I think a point that Alvin picked up. Um, from, from a climate point of view, it's so critical uh, in, in terms of climate, uh, uh, you know, particularly on uh, adaptation and some aspects of mitigation. If you look at uh, strengths of the irrigation systems uh, that are in place, and if you look at uh, water supply, uh, the non-revenue water is, is a major issue that has been highlighted in the uh, in, in this uh, plan assessment. And there are many other dimensions of climate uh, that we need to pick up in the water sector, which are reflected in the report as well as in the work uh, that that is being done across uh, ADB. Um, the second block uh, that uh, uh, is related to this area that is uh, in the operations plan is on the need for uh, uh, expand, accelerating and expanding the implementation of integrated water resources management. Now that's an area where we have mixed progress uh, because it really depends on what we are seeing in, in terms of capacity differences across uh, the countries. So what do we plan to do in the new operating model? 
uh, with regard to the climate shift is that, uh, you know, go through all of these. By the way, we are talking about one subsector here, uh, but you've got many other subsectors where climate obviously uh, matters as a cross cutting theme. Um, regions have, you know, within, amongst themselves or within, between countries, uh, there is very good cohesion, there is very good cooperation within a, a division, staff resources being used across the board. The sector groups or the thematic groups have been operating quite well also, but this is the first time we are uh, integrating uh, the uh, knowledge support services as well as operations. So we are quite optimistic. Obviously, any change uh, will always be complex, particularly in the initial stages. But in all the discussions we've been having, particularly in the last three months in setting up the sector group architecture, is that how can we use all the strong knowledge that we have across uh, the different parts of ADB, uh, and particularly working with our, the frontline voices that we uh, heard, um, can we use the resources in a, in a more flex much more flexible manner than uh, what we've had? Now, what I'm saying here, uh, it's uh, not just for the sector, but, uh, but uh, across uh, the board. Uh, particularly on climate shift, there is a lot that needs to be done in terms of mainstreaming um, climate into uh, the projects that we do. Mobilizing resources is also going to be quite critical because even if you have money, mobilizing skills is very critical uh, given the capacity constraints that we face in countries. And finally, the need for messaging is also going to be quite critical. Like, for example, if you're looking at NRW, uh, and irrigation productivity and efficiency and so on, what we are messaging at the national level may not be going down to the local government level. And between local governments and uh, communities, vast differences uh, that we see. Last point I wanted to make is on the, uh, the second shift on private sector uh, development. And here the report picks up, I think, if I remember the uh, second recommendation. Here, if you look at, uh, you know, right now the pure non-sovereign, i.e. PSOD footprint in the sector uh, is actually emerging. Uh, this is uh, quite low. In the sovereign operations, uh, we've been supporting policy, institutional, legal, regulatory reforms uh, in, in many projects um, you know, for, for many years. But are these leading to uh, concrete pathways for private sector investments to happen? The, uh, the answer is mixed. I think this is what uh, the IED finding as well looking at the water operation plan implementation. Uh, so in the new operating model, uh, we are also looking at particularly how can um, subnational, new innovative subnational solutions can be found, uh, particularly in the, uh, in the area of, I'll say broadly water, but probably there are more um, you know, immediate and easier pathways in water supply and sanitation. Uh, but with regard to uh, irrigation or bringing about IWRM changes, what role private sector has to play, uh, you know, what, what uh, can we innovate, that's something we need to look at. Let me pause uh, for now. Uh, Thanks a lot, Ramesh. And uh, we'll get back to your very important point about the private sector uh, in, 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 in a little bit, because I think that's a point that uh, hadn't been raised up, up to now, so thank you for doing that. And also thank you for uh, the uh, criticality that you mentioned about the need uh, to align not just with countries, but within countries, there might be different levels of government uh, that uh, are going to be very important, especially in this sector and the uh, effect of uh, uh, and how they coordinate with each other uh, is, is going to be key. And we'll also go back to the point about uh, the link to environment, because I, I think that that's something, and, and climate, which uh, hopefully will uh, um, uh, move forward on after we hear from you, uh, Keiko. Uh, you sit at the board and have an overview about uh, all of our operations, but also about the regional and global commitments that uh, ADB has been making, uh, including on climate, uh, but uh, also, of course, the SDGs are, are, are still there. Uh, could you tell us your perspective on, um, uh, from where you sit at that level on uh, how ADB is doing in this sector and what you see or uh, should be perhaps uh, being prioritized in, in the future? Thank you very much, Mani, and thank you very much for having me as a panelist. Uh, it's my first time to join this event, so <laughs> please allow me to give a, a kind of a fresh comments. And uh, so I'm grateful for ADB teams, uh, particularly the water sector group and the regional departments 
for continuous efforts in providing uh, much needed support in the water sector. And I also appreciate uh, the variable evaluation report by IED, uh, which provides uh, insights for what we can do uh, better for going forward. So to have a strategic perspective, uh, let me begin with uh, posing a question. Um, how would we like to reframe and position ADB's water sector group in tackling global challenges, including climate change, and also in promoting sustainable growth. So ADB, as a regional development bank, to support the disaster-prone region vulnerable to climate change, so it is critical to ADB is responsible for international commitments, including uh, SDGs and uh, the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework. So, but uh, at the same time, ADB is responsible for and also it's in a good position to lead the, take the lead in climate finance and sustainable finance, which I view is very important to promote sustainable development. The water sector might be considered as non-marketable, uh, uh, pure public goods, but uh, given limited fiscal space in many countries, it is critical, strategically critical to consider mobilizing private funds. So how would it be possible? How, what can we do going forward? So uh, I have a th three points, like a board meeting, sorry. <laughs> first, uh, first uh, uh, integrated approach. So I think ADV uh, should take a, a more integrated and a holistic approach, uh, consolidate uh, upstream and uh, downstream work under one ADB. Uh, which helps DMCs uh, to have a more stronger ownership in promoting uh, policy reforms and uh, enabling the environment and the building blocks. So ADB together with uh, other MDBs and also bilateral donors and engaging with the national and the local governments and the public and the private stakeholders on the ground. Um, ADB can support uh, policy reforms. And uh, for wider private sector engagement, ADB can also uh, design water-related projects in the urban sector context so that uh, it, can be, it can attract uh, private sector investment. So second, harnessing digital and uh, satellite technology. The water sector has great potential for wider use of digital and satellite technology. For example, using smart meters, uh, timely monitoring water supply and consumption combined with IoT devices uh, can uh, be used for better, um, for, for better water saving to raise consumer uh, saving incentives. And also satellite imaginary, uh, sorry, satellite images can provide a powerful uh, tool to, uh, to detect the quality of water and the extent of land degradation, which can be used for uh, more accurate uh, disaster risk management and planning, including uh, early warning systems. And such uh, technologies can provide a very powerful tools to visualize the impact of environment and development uh, related to uh, water-related projects and also the impact uh, caused by climate change. So it's not only helpful for uh, providing solutions for the water sector and also planning and uh, stakeholder engagement, but also attractive, uh, very helpful for attracting investors. So then my third point is uh, how to mobilize private funds. So blended finance can, be, can attract private capital to investment to support 
climate mitigation and adaptation, but also uh, biodi uh, bi biodiversity. But in addition, if market uh, conditions are met, uh, capital market instruments, including green and uh, blue bonds, would be uh, very uh, helpful to mobilize private funds to uh, potentially uh, to attract the ESG investors. So we could encourage governments and local communities to uh, banks and to firm to issue such uh, water related bonds that would be blue or green bonds. And so to, to conclude my initial <laughs> uh, response, it is strategically very important to create an ecosystem in which um, the water sector is integrated in wider economic development context and supported by upstream and downstream work, uh, facilitating private sector uh, participation and uh, sustainable for sustainable development while monitoring the impact of environment and uh, development uh, with advanced technology. Thank you very much, Keiko. I think uh, the three points you raised are really critical uh, uh, issues uh, on uh, how to integrate ourselves within the uh, ADB to make sure that we're able to respond uh, holistically, uh, to use uh, new technologies to the extent possible, and then to really be creative about financing. In fact, I like Norio and Ramesh, your views on, on, on some of these. Maybe I can start with uh, the views on uh, how to make sure that we're integrated more across sectors, not just within sectors in the ADB. Um, uh, when I was at the World Bank, uh, we also formed global practices. Uh, and, and what we found there was, this was a double-edged sword. The global practice was uh, more integrated within itself, but they became what somebody called guilds, in which it was much more difficult to cut across sectors. And I was wondering, Ramesh and Norio, how do we make sure, given what Keiko mentioned about uh, the need to work across sectors, that we strengthen our sector groups while at the same time ensuring that interconnectivity that I think all of you mentioned is also very important. Thank you, uh, Manny. Uh, this is, you know, when, when you mentioned the word uh, guild, I was thinking about, we've got in, in ADB as well, particularly, you know, as the norm has been, has, has been worked on, uh, this concern is definitely has been there and will continue to be there. Uh, in fact, you know, right now I have put together about 38 or so KPIs for the sector group as a whole. And uh, five or six of them uh, are on intersectoral coordination. Uh, but we need to flesh it out as uh, each of the sector groups evolves its own uh, work plans. I, I think, you know, uh, there are two ways of looking at it, right? Uh, first is at the, um, you have the country partnership strategies. And then when you're looking at uh, individual investment projects, um, there are differences between sovereign and non-sovereign uh, operations. But the question is, um, you know, what are all the essential ingredients that we need to look at in a project? Uh, I've been also talking to staff from across, uh, you know, different regional departments because my focus in the last few years has been more on Southeast Asia. Um, there was an irrigation expert who spoke to me, said that, you know, we do our irrigation projects very well. Uh, but if you ask the question at the end of the day, are these projects changing the lives of poor farmers? Uh, you know, this colleague's perspective was, I don't know, not necessarily. Uh, but he didn't mean it in a negative manner. He said we could have done a lot better in terms of linking those irrigation projects with uh, agriculture or agribusiness value chains. Uh, you know, so the question is, why did we not do this in the past? Uh, can we do a better job? Now, you can say that it's within the sector vertical, uh, if you're looking at agri business value chain and uh, irrigation. But I think uh, people may be, the specialists may be looking at it in, uh, in a particular way. So how do we really address opportunities for intra as well as inter-sectoral sectoral coordination at the stage of the concept paper. Now, that stage is so important because that, that, that's what determines quality at entry. 
because oftentimes if we lose that, then subsequently we lose the boat. We may not be able to make changes. So these KPIs that uh, you know I'm looking at particularly uh, in in terms of like you know water is a cross cutting uh, subsector as we know between water supply and sanitation as well as uh, agriculture and natural resources. So between these two big sector verticals, uh, we need to achieve coordination. And then if you take a broader IWRM perspective, then you have the water, food, energy nexus that uh, we need to consider. And if you look at in the urban space, a uh, lot of other issues come in as well, and, and rural space as well in terms of uh, overall uh, planning, urban planning, spatial planning, and so on. So what we are uh, really hoping is that with all the sectors coming together, uh, how do we make sure that the uh, it, it does not create new vertical silos? Uh, and how do we make sure that we are not missing opportunities? I know these answers are kind of abstract, but I just want to let let you know that these are issues that we are looking at and also looking at past projects uh, uh, where we have not done well what can we learn from them is also going to be critical uh, thanks uh, thanks Ramesh uh, Norio I mean you're, you're in the sector uh, right now in urban and water where these cross-cutting issues must confront you all the time any lessons uh, quick lessons from you on uh, how do we make sure that we act in an integrated way Thank you for that question. I think Ramesh covered very well about this intersectoral coordination issues. Um, so for the kind of intrasectoral issues, uh, you know, urban and water is also will cover very broad ranges of issues. So what I have been proposing now is to establish a couple of whatever you, know, like you, you call it working groups or some network. So that, so that each of the specific issues, uh, staff who are interested in those topics or have specialties in those topics, will create network across the regions so that they can keep each other informed about the new knowledge or new technologies available or their experiences. Because one of the significant benefits of NOM is that all sector divisions come together under one roof which makes it much easier to share knowledge, share experiences across the regions. And also, we can much more flexibly deploy staff working in one region to another region, depending on their staff's skill sets and experience. Right? If one person has good you know, process like one policy-based loan in Sri Lanka in the water sector, and then similar requests came from Cambodia, maybe he or she can support that that processing. So that kind of you know cross learning or knowledge sharing would be a much easier to make. And for this inter intersectoral collaboration as Ramesh made, as uh, Ramesh already commented. So particularly the water sector this collaboration in my case with Chimp and the team about you know ANR issue that, that's really critical. So we have been discussing how this can be you know bet managed in a most effective manner. So that so that we don't you know we don't work in, in silos in, in, in among between the two sectors. No, thanks, Norio. Now I'll be turning to the audience in a second, but uh, before we do, uh, uh, Keiko, uh, another uh, question for you on in, uh, integration this time of the international community. Uh, from uh, your experience at, uh, in Japan and elsewhere, are there opportunities for ADB to work more closely with other partners, development partners? Uh, in promoting water and, and urban uh, services uh, to help uh, our DMCs. Thank you very much for your question. I think it is very critical to collab collaborate uh, effectively with the international community, uh, including bilateral donors and uh, other development partners, because uh, many challenges are now shared by the international community. And so we should take advantage of this momentum so we should cooperate in the same direction. And Japan uh, is, of course, supportive to ADB's water sector activities and others. And Japan has uh, you know, benefited from water in its uh, development for <laughs> over decades. <laughs> and Japan is also a disaster-prone country, as you know, where we suffer from flooding, 
typhoons and uh, no surprise uh, the degree of uh, you know di disaster has been being much you know more extreme uh, year by year so we have uh, experience so the commitment to the international co cooperation is uh, strong so yes so it's very critical to partner with uh, others no, thanks very much. One other question that, uh, that, that came up was on the private sector. And, and uh, uh, across almost all of the sectors in the ADB, this is really uh, quite a, uh, uh, an agenda item. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Noria, if I can come back to you, and uh, especially in your experience in, in, in SARD, what are some of the challenges in bringing the private sector on board to uh, support these, uh, these activities? Okay, thank you for that question, Mani. Um, okay, let me start with this distinguishing financing and funding. You know, finan financing is who's going to first pay for the like infrastructure development. Funding is who's going to eventually pay for the services provided. So in order to attract private sector financing, we need to do more to support funding part so that we can leverage more financing from the private sector. So, so this goes back to this issue of uh, enabling environment policy institutions policy, uh, and regulations. So in this sector, it's, it's quite challenging because local governments or many of the motor utilities, their capacities are quite limited, including their you know, um, capacity to, to generate resources. So, so we need to start from those, those aspects so that they can have you know, more funding to leverage, leverage financing. And that's a long-term process. And uh, so the policy dialogue with client governments is quite essential. But this is also challenging because you know, some of these issues are quite sensitive, like water tariff is a very politically sensitive. Especially for the, for the poorest areas. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah so, so there are many challenges, but I think we need to, you know, gradually strengthen our dialogues about with, uh, with the client governments to get their understanding and uh, eventually you know, start improving policies and regulations. And that will help uh, the private sector uh, participation in the later. So, so in, in our team, I think when we see the potential to, for private sector participation or collaboration with PPP, from the beginning of the project or program conceptualization, we are now inviting staff from OPPP or PSOD to join the project teams. So they can advise us, okay, these are the critical elements for the private sector to come in. So that way we are you know, gradually moving towards more private sector participation. Oh, thanks. Uh, Ramesh, I mean, uh, Noria raised the point that you need uh, people to be able to pay. And I know water tariffs are not just an economic issue, but a political one in some of our DMCs. Uh, uh, what has your experience been in, in convincing countries, for example, to tackle some of these tough issues, such as uh, tariffs, and uh, what, whether there might be, a, there might be a constraint for expanding the role of the private sector? Uh, the, uh, well, we, we've had engagements in a number of countries uh, in terms of the overall policy um, legal and regulatory framework. Water is a, uh, you know, you've got national policies in many countries, but water is also a local uh, subject, particularly when it comes to um, asset ownership and management. I'll just mention one country, Indonesia, which went through a rapid decentralization process. Uh, you know, overnight uh, from a nationally administered water sector, uh, you went to over 500 local governments dealing with uh, water utilities and water entities. Their willingness to pay for services, obviously you've got uh, uh, regulations are managed locally as well. You've got an overall legal framework, a regulatory framework. Um, India, I think Norio can speak uh, for, for, for India much, much more uh, you know, eloquently. State level subject, you've got national level overall framework, but it is at the uh, state level. So I think it really varies. Our inroads have been, uh, cert I, I would say, in many countries where we've engaged in, uh, we've certainly gone into uh, deeper diagnostics, analysis, and paving way for change. Uh, in cases where, again, Indonesia, where PSOD has also gone in, 
Uh, for West Jakarta Water Concession, this was about 15 years, more than 15 years ago. Even those days when we did not have 180B type of framework, the work between sovereign and non-sovereign uh, uh, parts of ADB was actually very close. Uh, so now moving forward, what we are looking at under the new model is that this is an area where a lot more can be done, uh, particularly in uh, terms of bringing uh, broader private sector investments, but also greater uh, ADB, PSOD investments. But uh, we need to do a lot of granular work uh, because risks are significant. Uh, and you know, take a look at the financing and funding distinction. Uh, financing will come only if those risks are addressed. Uh, so in Vietnam, for instance, we did uh, two small water supply transactions with a lot of sector background analytics done by sovereign teams, and PSOD uh, came into work in partnership. We are right now uh, working in creating a, an overall kind of a risk framework uh, for particularly water investments in urban areas, water supply investments in urban areas. The idea is that we will uh, select some cities and municipalities uh, do in-depth work, kind of building on what EBRD had done uh, in setting up the municipal finance framework. So it's quite exciting, but it's going to be time-consuming. Uh, a lot of uh, capacity building will be needed, and also ADB staff time investments as well. Yeah, and as you pointed out earlier, the need to really integrate knowledge with the operational part uh, to do that lesson learning uh, well and, uh, and, synth and, and synthesizing. Uh, Keiko, I just wanted to get back to this uh, point. Uh, any co comments, but by the way, or, or questions from, from the floor? Uh, yes, please. Hi, I'm Lance Gore. I'm from uh, South Asia Department, Water Resources Specialist. I thought someone should say something from the floor, anyway, for the panel. Just coming back to the original point that. Uh, you know, without water security, it's difficult to have economic security. I would say, without assured water security, you cannot have economic security. Mm. Water is fundamental for all economic growth. Um, and I'm very heartened by the discussion today on the panel. You're very much highlighted on the key points. And, and if, if we consider that water is fundamental to, water, uh, to, economy, to the economic security, then water can be equated to being money itself, and it is. And when it comes to money, people like to keep hold of it. And that makes its governance very challenging. And this is where improving policies and water governance, integrated water resources management is critical. But these are very challenging and long-term endeavors. And it's important that ADB plays a role in this. We have that long-term engagement with, with the states and, and the countries that we work in. And we're just starting to see that now. We're working in India and South Asia a lot. We are actually st starting to contribute and help the states and those countries improve their water policy, particularly along an IWRM uh, uh, approach and, and framework. Agricultural water consumes up to 80% of all consumed water in these river basins. So it's really important that we do look at a river basin approach and IWRM and look at how, the, how we can improve water use efficiency uh, in, ag in irrigated agriculture. And particularly with Norio's uh, comment about circular economy, we're seeing a lot more uh, irrigation systems now relying on treated wastewater or even non-treated wastewater. But it's becoming a reality that that is what's needed to keep um, the, the systems running and food security. So for me, you know, this sector is, is critical. I'm very heartened to see what's happening under NOM and the, the fact that we can work more closely with our urban colleagues, um, but also energy colleagues as well. So thank you for that. No, uh, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I think I'm sure there's an issue, Keiko, that the board has in mind is how ADB is working together on this. Uh, but uh, uh, over, over to you. Thank you very much. I totally agree with you and also as a panelist. Uh, the ADV, uh, one ADV will be tested actually because the water sector is really uh, the nexus of water and food and uh, energy security. But uh, even much more, it's really the center of uh, climate change and uh, in promoting uh, sustainable growth, development. So I think uh, how to collaborate within ADP and also uh, with the outside ADP is really critical. And uh, although the water sector is really challenging, 
because it's not considered to be profitable, at least in the past and now. But I think at the same time, there is a potential because of the, this connectivity with other sectors and also the uh, really linked to other themes. So if combining very effectively with the urban sector and also uh, the agricultural value chain, as already mentioned, that might provide a really potential area for the private sector. And I really hope that will happen. And I think use of digital technology and satellite technology, that probably can make a difference. So this will reduce the burden that used to be borne by you know, people on the ground, but that might break that, you know, dramatically reduce the burden and also will uh, probably we we will be able to see the you know what we couldn't see in the past. So that's also the chance of business opportunities. It's well, a thanks. very difficult. But Thank you very much, uh, Keiko. Uh, I think those are uh, actually quite inspired words. Uh, Norio Ramesh, any last word from you? A, a message to our uh, colleagues here in the ADB. Just uh, you have uh, 15 seconds each. Oops. <laughs> That's, that's a big challenge. I just want to share one number with everyone. Last year, climate financing from the water sector amounted to 55% of the total sector commitment. This was twice as high as 2021, which was 27%. And 86% of this amount is for adaptation financing. So this is quite encouraging. I, I do not think this will go much higher than 55%. Because you know we have we need to meet the development needs of our clients, but but I think we are moving to the right direction. We are having more upstream climate assessment, and then in which inform the design of the project. But I think you know all the project teams are working hard on this on this respect. So I think uh, we just need to continue this effort. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Norio. Ramesh, last word, a few words. Just uh, very briefly, more integrated thinking is needed on uh, to achieve the two shifts, the climate and the PSD shifts. I totally agree with, uh, echo with what uh, Lance mentioned um, in, in uh, terms of looking at uh, agriculture or the whole IW or a issue. Uh, for climate bringing in private sector and climate together, there are some good models that we have across um, Asia and Pacific. So I think the new model provides opportunities for learning, the point that you made in terms of knowledge. I'm looking at Ramola used to work on a concept called Green City Action Plans uh, that have now become quite uh, you know, popular uh, in the Southeast Asia region. I see Sonia as well. Uh, so this is a concept that we are now um, uh, expanding uh, across, and I'm hoping that you know we could uh, learn from Southeast Asia for other regions. I'm sure there are lots of interesting uh, experiments or initiatives in uh, other parts of the region which we can uh, bring to other sub-regions. So integrated thinking will be quite critical to achieve uh, the two shifts, the climate and the PSD shifts, which is what I would like to focus on. Thanks very much. And thank you, uh, all of you, for a fascinating and very informative uh, conversation on a very critical uh, sector. So please join me in thanking our panel uh, for uh, this event.